violent attackers snatched weapons from Congolese police and fired upon our uniformed personnel. Sadly, one military peacekeeper and two UN police personnel were killed, and another was injured. We added our voice to the acting head of MONUSCO, Hasim Jeng, to condemn the killing of our colleagues and to express our deepest sympathy to their, family and, to their families and colleagues. Mr. Jeng has described the violence against the UN as absolutely unacceptable and counterproductive, given that the mission is in the country to work alongside local authorities to protect civilians, deter armed groups, and build the capacity of state institutions and services. He called on Congolese authorities, civil society, and community groups to denounce the violence. It is not in chaos and confusion or division that we will make progress towards stability and peace, he said. At least four incidents have targeted MONUSCO staff residences, and other staff have now been relocated to camps. Earlier today, a mob tried to enter the premises of the UNDP compound in Goma, but were repelled by security guards. Hundreds of, of assailants have again attacked our bases in Goma, as well as other parts of North Kivu province, fueled by hostile remarks and threats made by individuals and groups against the UN, particularly on social media. Mobs are throwing stones and petrol bombs, breaking into bases, looting and vandalizing, and setting facilities on fire. The situation is very volatile, and reinforcements are being mobilized. Our quick reaction forces are on high alert and have been advised to exercise maximum restraint, using tear gas to disperse protesters and only firing warning shots when UN personnel or property are under attack. Some assistance to protect facilities is being received from the Congolese armed forces. OK. All right, let's, let's take it from the top then. Uh, good afternoon. We have an update from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where violence against our peacekeeping mission is continuing to escalate. At the MONUSCO Butembo base today, violent attackers snatched weapons from Congolese police and fired upon our uniformed personnel. Sadly, one military peacekeeper and two UN police personnel were killed, and another was injured. We add our voice to the acting head of MONUSCO, Kasim Dien, to uh, condemn the killing of our colleagues and to express our deepest sympathy to their families and colleagues. Mr. Jiang has described the violence against the UN as absolutely unacceptable and counterproductive, given that the mission is in the country to work alongside local authorities to protect civilians, deter armed groups, and build the capacity of state institutions and services. He called on Congolese authorities, civil society, and community groups to denounce the violence. It is not in chaos and confusion or division that we will make progress towards stability and peace, he said. At least four incidents have targeted MONUSCO staff residences, and other staff have now been relocated to camps. Earlier today, a mob tried to enter the premises of the UNDP compound in Goma, but were repelled by security guards. Hundreds of assailants have again attacked our bases in Goma, as well as other parts of North Kivu province, fueled by hostile remarks and threats made by individuals and groups against the UN, particularly on social media. Mobs are throwing stones and petrol bombs, breaking into bases, looting and vandalizing, and setting facilities on fire. The situation is very volatile, and reinforcements are being mobilized. Our quick reaction forces are on high alert and have been advised to exercise maximum restraint using tear gas to disperse protesters and only firing warning shots when UN personnel or property are under attack. Some assistance to protect facilities is being received from the Congolese armed forces. Turning to Ukraine, our colleagues tell us that yesterday we, along with our humanitarian partners, delivered 50 tons of relief supplies for 5,000 people to Stepnohirsk, close to the front lines in southeastern Zaporizhka Oblast. The convoy contained life-saving supplies, including medicine, food, blankets, and other essentials. Some of the supplies will be sent to the neighboring town of Primorske, another settlement which is heavily affected by war. While the new convoy will provide much-needed relief for people in the government-controlled areas of Zaporizhka Oblast, the humanitarian coordinator for Ukraine, Usnat Lubrani, notes that humanitarians in the country are still unable to send supplies to areas that are not controlled by the government. Yesterday's convoy, for example, was supposed to reach the town of Polohi, on the other side of the front line. Ongoing hostilities and lack of agreement with parties to, conflict, to the conflict prevented us from going there. Ms. Lubrani emphasized that humanitarians will continue to work on delivering relief convoys 
to non-government controlled areas and the hardest hit locations. Meanwhile, hostilities continue to severely affect the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. In Odessa, for example, our humanitarian colleagues witnessed the missile attack on the 23rd of July that struck the port area. No casualties were reported. The southern city of Mykolaiv, where a large humanitarian air aid warehouse was destroyed last week, and the eastern city of Kharkiv have been under daily attack in the past week. We continue to call on all parties, on the parties to the conflict, to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure, as well as to allow for life-saving aid to reach the hardest hit locations, including non-government controlled areas. This is critical to prevent further suffering. Lynn Hastings, the Deputy Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, briefed the Security Council this morning on the Israeli-Palestinian situation and said that we continue to witness con concerning levels of violence against civilians, which exacerbates mistrust and undermines a peaceful resolution to the conflict. She said that there is a growing sense of hopelessness among many Palestinians who see their prospects for statehood, sovereignty, and a peaceful future slipping away. And she added that many Israelis also understand the perils of continuing along the current path. They see endless cycles of violence, the constant risk of escalation, and the absence of prospects to end the conflict. The deputy special coordinator said that the tensions had, that have been mounting, particularly in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem amidst continued settlement activity and settler-related violence, must be addressed. However, she added, there's no substitute for a legitimate political process that will resolve the core issues driving the conflict. Martha Pobi, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa, briefed the Security Council yesterday on Libya, calling the situation there highly volatile. She said that despite progress achieved, the constitutional and political stalemate persists, prolonging the tense security environment with an increased number of clashes in and around Tripoli. The economic situation remains dire, heightened by the politicization of the National Oil Corporation, she added. Despite promising progress achieved, one outstanding issue prevented the finalization of the agreement in Geneva, Ms. Pobi said. The parties did not reach consensus on the question of eligibility requirements for presidential candidates. Special Advisor Stephanie Williams has remained in contact with the parties and urged them to bridge this gap. In a statement we issued yesterday, the Secretary General strongly condemned the executions carried out this weekend by the Myanmar military against four political activists in Myanmar and offered his condolences to their families. As you know, the Secretary General opposes the imposition of, death penal of the death penalty in all circumstances. The Secretary General reiterates his call for the immediate release of all arbitrary, arbitrarily detained prisoners, including President Win Mint and State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi. And Noeline Haser, Special Envoy in Myanmar, is in Malaysia, where she met today with Foreign Minister Saifuddin Abdullah and Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaqub to discuss the situation in Myanmar and the need for inclusive engagement and innovative solutions for the Rohingya in and outside of Myanmar. The Special Envoy emphasized that Malaysia, as a member of ASEAN and the Organization of Islamic Co Cooperation, has an important role to play in mobilizing an effective regional and international response. In Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues continue to provide critical assistance to millions of people affected by conflict and drought. Some 3.8 million people in Tigray have received food assistance and convoys resumed in April, but distribution has been largely on hold since early Jan July due to lack of fuel. Likewise, distributing assistance within Tigray is also constrained by a lack of cash. Last week, over 2,000 tons of fertilizer arrived in, in Mekele, with a further 5,000 tons sent to Afar. This falls short of the 60,000 tons that are needed to support the current planting season. In Afar region, we are witnessing alarming levels of malnutrition. Needs also remain high in the neighboring Amhara region. Since late April, more than 2 million people have received food assistance in Amhara and Afar. In western Ethiopia, ongoing conflict has caused displacement and damaged infrastructure and services. We and our partners are working to provide assistance, but the response is constrained by insecurity and lack of funding. In addition, the country is experiencing one of the most severe droughts in the last 40 years. According to the World Food Program, close to 10 million people now require food assistance in drought-affected areas. The crippling drought is also causing a hunger crisis in Kenya and Somalia. In Somalia, over 200,000 people are facing catastrophic food insecurity, and there's a reasonable chance of famine in 17 districts if crop and livestock production fail, food production continues to rise, and humanitarian assistance is not sustained to reach the most vulnerable populations. 
The UN Human Rights Office today released a report which says that the rising levels of violence perpetrated by non-state armed groups and criminal organizations in rural areas of Colombia are having a devastating impact in vulnerable populations, including human rights defenders. Last year, the UN Human Rights Office in Colombia verified the killing of 100 human rights defenders. Between the 1st of January and the 30th of June this year, the office received information on 114 killings of human rights defenders, of which 22 cases have been verified so far. The report urges the incoming government, which takes office next month, to prioritize tackling this violence. It also sets out a series of recommendations for the authorities to implement urgently to protect the lives and human rights of those affected. And that's it for me. Yes, uh, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Quite a number of follow-up questions on the situation in Congo. Uh, first of all, do you know of any civilian casualties? There have been reported deaths of civilians. Um, we are aware of these reports. Mm -hmm. uh, those will need to be followed up on and investigated. And of course, uh, uh, we'll uh, keep track of uh, also uh, any uh, investigations being carried out by the national authorities in this regard. Do we know where the military peacekeeper and the uh, two UN police personnel who were killed and the one injured were from? Um, I, I do have an idea, but until I know that the, that the home governments have been informed, I don't know whether I can share that with you. We do expect uh, that there will be a statement uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, behalf of the spokesperson uh, coming out later this afternoon, and we hope to have some of those details for you then. And can you tell us what is the current situation? Um, is the mob still going after UN personnel and UN facilities? Uh, we, we are trying to, to calm things down, including with uh, the, the dispatch of other forces, including quick reaction forces, but as, as of now, uh, I do not uh, have any confirmation that this, uh, that this activity has ended. Uh, James? So more on that, if I can. Um, some of the reports of civilians being killed or protesters being killed uh, suggests that they, there, are, there are witnesses, including journalists, who saw UN peacekeepers shooting dead protesters. Can you confirm this? I, I cannot. I mean, obviously, everything will be confirmed. But I would like to point out that one of the factors involved in the start of this violence is that there has been already, for some days running, uh, a campaign of disinformation and misinformation against the UN. Uh, so there have been things which we know to be false that have been spread. So we're trying to our best to get uh, uh, to the truth about this. Uh, obviously, if there's any, uh, if, if there's any uh, responsibility by UN uh, uh, forces for any of the injuries uh, or any of the deaths, we, we, will, we will follow up on that. But, uh, but yes, we do first need to get to the truth of what, uh, what's happening on the ground. Let me just on that, though, say the source that I've read is a Reuters report, Reuters news agency, yeah. quoting a Reuters reporter who saw with their own eyes UN peacekeepers shooting dead protesters. Um, okay. So, well, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's an example of things that we, we will have to follow up on and, and see. So let's just ask this question then. Given the um, extreme situation, what were the rules of engagement of the UN peacekeepers? Were they um, allowed to shoot to kill? No. I, as far as I'm aware, uh, the, the, all, all peacekeepers have been instructed to exercise the utmost restraint. Uh, as I believe we reported yesterday, uh, when, uh, when there were similar incidents at our bases, uh, they were ab able to use uh, tear gas and to fire into the air. But uh, ob obviously, uh, 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 the situation on the ground has, has changed uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, as some of these compounds have, become, uh, have been breached. I, I don't know uh, whether that materially changed their response. And my last question on this, there is now an AOB planned at the end of the afternoon. Um, in the council after the Iraq, after the Middle East meeting, then after the Iran-Iraq-Turkey Iraq, meeting, called I believe by India, um, are you planning to have a briefer there to brief the Security Council? And if you are, 
Can that person please, given the importance of this story, brief the press? This is one of the moments where we really need real information, real first-hand information. It would be good if the acting SRSG could do a news conference later this evening. Well, um, and at this stage, uh, the question is who, where, whether they will have a briefer in person, and if that, uh, and if there is one, we'll try to bring that person to the stakeout for you. So we'll we'll definitely uh, put in uh, put in that request. I have other questions, but I'll yield to to okay, others. Okay, uh, so let's first clear out questions on uh, on this topic. Uh, uh, Pam. Oh, uh, it's on the Black Sea Initiative. Oh, 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 well, uh, then okay. uh, Maggie first, and then and then I'll turn to you. Thank you. Um, so has the Secretary General been informed, and what's his reaction? And Mr. Lacroix is in the region, in Mali anyway, on the continent. Will he now travel to DRC to meet with the government? And, and then I have one more. Yes, we do expect Mr. Lacroix to travel to the DRC at his earliest opportunity. Uh, obviously, he has to um, uh, uh, go about some business in Mali first, but we expect him to go to, to DRC afterwards to take up these issues. Uh, the Secretary General is apprised of this um, uh, this development, uh, and uh, and uh, I I believe he may uh, make some calls on this. Although I don't have any to report just yet. And then finally, um, sorry, uh, you mentioned that the uh, FARDC was responding or assisting uh, the peacekeepers. Yes. Can you just give us a little more detail on that? I mean. How many units or battalions? Or uh, I I don't I don't know. I uh, are they giving uh, air support? Of, but uh, but they they are trying to provide additional protection to to the bases. Would that be ground or air support? As far as I know, it's ground support. Uh, yes. Thank you, thank you, Farhan. On the Black Sea Initiative, uh, more than you've talked about, uh, their U.S. side says that there may be the first grain shipment tomorrow could take up to 36 hours to get out of port. Um, will these be ships that are, according to the deal, uh, steered by Ukrainian Navy or Ukra Ukrainian Coast Guard? And can you give us any more details on it? Uh, not in advance. Uh, you're, you're aware that uh, under the deal, the, the Ukrainians provide a, a, a safe waterway passage across the, the Black Sea. Any in inspection activity would be done uh, by uh, by Turkish personnel, uh, uh, but uh, also with the support of the Joint Coordination Committee, and uh, and I and we are trying to get more details about uh, the Joint Coordination Committee as it becomes operational. We uh, we do um, we are trying over the next couple of days to get Martin Griffiths to come and be a guest at this very briefing to uh, to talk to you about some of these topics and 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 other humanitarian not topics as as his purview is very that would, wide that would be great one follow up the inspections i understood to be on the way back not on the way out of the boats is that true oh. in other words on the return yes uh, I, I, well the, the inspections are for the exports yeah yeah okay Yes, sure. Can we go, hi, Farhan. Can you go back to DRC, please? Um, according to the Reuters report, um, the demonstrations were called by a faction of the ruling party's youth wing that accuses MINUSCO of failing to protect civilians against militia violence. How does the UN respond to that? We have been doing our utmost, uh, as you know, not just for years, but really for decades, to try to uh, bring stability uh, to Eastern Congo, a, a place where, as you know, there are many different armed factions. There are times when, uh, when some of those factions had ceased their activities, others rose up. Uh, the point of it is that throughout it, we have maintained forces to make sure that we can provide as much security uh, to the Eastern Congo as, as can possibly be provided. And and have uh, and as you know, uh, uh, Monusco and its predecessors, uh, predecessor forces, have sustained uh, significant casualties over the years trying to trying to achieve that. Uh, our, our commitment uh, to uh, to the Democratic Republic of the Congo is uh, is a long and solid record. Uh, yes, Edie. Um, a follow up on the grain shipments. I had read the agreement and understood that the inspections were going to be on uh, ships 
going in to pick up the grain to ensure that they were not bringing weapons into Ukraine, yeah. okay. and also on the way out, and that they yes. were going to be done by all four parties, not just the Turks. Uh, the the Joint Coordination Committee brings together all all four parties. You're quite correct that that all four are are involved in that. Uh, I I don't have a detailed um, rules of how the inspections are con conducted, but they will be conducted by joint inspection teams under the auspices of the Joint Coordination Committee, and it uh, will coordinate uh, with the relevant authorities to determine appropriate actions if there is any non-compliance. And, and you're right, it will, it will be f in both directions. And you had said that there was going to be um, an announcement soon of who's going to head the Joint Coordination Committee. Uh, when can we expect that announcement? Hopefully, hopefully fairly soon. I, I, it, it shall not be today, though. Um, we'll first do Evelyn and, and then uh, Linda. Just a brief Evelyn. question. Do we know when uh, Mr. Griffiths will be coming? Uh, possibly Thursday, maybe earlier. We'll see. Um, oh, uh, uh, Michelle Nichols has a question online, and then we'll turn to Linda. Thanks, Farhan. Um, a question on the grain deal as well, with the announcement that the Coordination Centre will be formally opening tomorrow. Um, we've seen notes going out um, from various um, places um, asking for ships to shipping companies to sign up um, to be included in convoys. How many ships have signed up? And are there any issues with fuel and getting enough fuel um, to the ports in Ukraine to make this happen? Thanks. Right now, what we're trying to do is just ensure that uh, that uh, there is sufficient safety, uh, uh, both for these ships to travel and and to encourage other ships. Uh, at this stage, uh, I, there's no problems with fuel to report. Uh, Linda, and then James. Thank you, Farhan. Um, this involves, um, uh, you know, the the uh, deal that was made, obviously we've been speaking about the Black Sea deal. On the other side, the Russian deal in terms of, I know the Secretary General has been very concerned that this Russian deal to get food and fertilizer out. Um, I was just wondering if there are any developments there, any announcements about how that will work or um, and when possibly this might get started. Well, the, the the, this work is already beginning. Um, uh, Rebecca Greenspan and her colleagues in UNCTAD will help uh, uh, proceed with this. The, the point of that is um, that this is uh, trying to facilitate trade in commodities that already uh, are tradable because they do not uh, uh, fall under the, uh, the sanctions that have been, uh, that have been uh, imposed. And so uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, the sort of factors that had uh, prevented uh, uh, governments or commercial entities from uh, proceeding with that trade are, are removed. Uh, so uh, that is already underway, uh, mostly, uh, like I said, uh, through uh, Rebecca Greenspan. She will, have, uh, she will also be forming a, a task team that will help her with this. Um, Yes, James, and then uh, Dulce in the back. So back to DRC, your answer to show when you talked about the very long service of the UN in DRC, in Eastern DRC, um, MONUSCO, and, and, it, and its, um, um, its predecessor organizations. Um, given that, and where we are now, I mean, the UN's whole effort has been a complete failure, hasn't it? Um, you've still got armed groups roving around the country that you've not been able to subdue. And, I mean, I know it's not entirely clear whether the protests are reflective of the general view of the people, but it sounds like the, the mission isn't even welcome by the people that it's supposed to be protecting anymore. Do you have to reconsider whether this mission is doing more harm than good? As you know, there have been times over the years when we have actually developed plans to draw down uh, and even plans to ultimately, in the long term, withdraw UN peacekeepers from the Congo uh, because of the circumstances on the ground and also because 
ultimately of the mandates provided by the Security Council, we have stayed because the situation on the ground is, is uh, far too dangerous for us to contemplate uh, uh, leaving and, and putting that many people at risk. The fact is, our presence has provided protection, but it has not solved the problem because the problem is a much larger one. It's a, it's a problem affecting not just Eastern Congo, but the, but the region as a whole, uh, with different groups vying for control of territory, control of resources. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that needs uh, a, a much wider solution. But we have been doing our best within that uh, to make sure that, uh, that people's lives, people's basic uh, freedoms are not, uh, are, not, uh, are not taken away. I've got a, a question on another subject. Uh, I've, got, I've actually got three questions on other subjects, but I'll do one okay. more now and then maybe you okay, can Okay, and then let's, uh, let's yeah, let your yeah. colleagues have some questions. Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, Haiti, um, apparently 209 people have been killed in just 10 days uh, in, in, in the gang warfare there in Haiti. Um, how concerned is the Secretary General? And maybe you could, could bring us... Uh, some idea of his thinking. Apparently he told ambassadors at a recent Security Council lunch that one of his ideas was for a police strike force. What is the, what, 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 are, the, what are the ideas that the Secretary General is thinking about here? How would such a police strike force work? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, characterize it as a strike force, but certainly... Well, those are apparently the words he used with ambassadors. But... Uh, but certainly what the, sec uh, what the Security Council has asked the Secretary General is to have proposals for, uh, for ways in which uh, the, the UN can uh, greater assist in terms of dealing with the problems of insecurity. You'll have seen the resolution that was passed uh, by the Security Council. We're going to follow up on it. And the Secretary General will, in fact, contain formal proposals. So you'll be able to see them in the report. Th those are being developed uh, in, in large part there, there are uh, proposals that concern uh, training of, of Haitian personnel on the ground, and, and uh, we'll be able to talk about it more fully once, once you see the report that the Secretary General provides to the Security Council in response to their request. Okay, um, Dulcie and then Alan. Okay, thanks very much. So I wanted to go back to the Joint Coordination Center. Uh, so uh, it sounds like all four parties to the deal are going to be working together to inspect and monitor the grain shipments. Are, so yes. does that mean the Russian and the Ukrainian representatives will be working physically in the same center, in the same room, in the same office? Uh, I don't have uh, details on the logistics uh, of, of, of um, the Joint Coordination Center to tell you. Uh, that they are, um, you know, they are... Um, going to be located uh, on, on the ground in Istanbul. Uh, and I believe I had mentioned, um, I had mentioned that they were at, uh, uh, they, they will be located in a building within uh, the uh, National Defense University in Istanbul. Uh, uh, again, the UN will uh, take the leadership of uh, the coordination of these efforts. Uh, I believe it is um, under under this agreement. It is uh, the Turkish personnel who are performing inspections. Okay, um, Alan, and then uh, Yoshita is has a question on the screen. Uh, Alan first. Thank you, Farhan. I have a follow up on this joint um, coordination center. Uh, can you already s uh, tell to us who will represent the UN in this body? Yeah, I hope to be able to tell you who, who is the, the head of the, the UN uh, uh, group at the Joint Coordination Center uh, shortly. I don't have that announcement today. Uh, Yoshita? Thank you. Um, thank you, Farhan. This is about the uh, two Indian peacekeepers that have been killed in the MINUSCO. I, uh, there were several questions on that. What's the SG's comment on it? And uh, I mean, the peace, UN peacekeeping's comment on that? Thanks. Uh, well, Thank you for confirming for me that uh, the nationality of two of the peacekeepers mm -hmm. are, in fact, from India. Uh, that, that, uh, no, no, but, ser but seriously, I mean, fa family members do need to be notified. Um, 
but um, uh, but it, it's very clear that uh, uh, that uh, this is uh, something that should not have happened. It's an unacceptable uh, action, uh, and and we condemn the killing of our colleagues. We do express our deepest sympathies uh, to their families and colleagues, uh, and and of course uh, we will send our sympathies as well uh, to the government of India for this. Um, I, I believe we've been in touch with the Indian mission on, on uh, the, the two fallen um, uh, peacekeepers. And we do expect, like I said earlier, uh, a statement uh, of ex expressing the Secretary General's views on, on today's incidents. Um, Great, thank you. Because the uh, external affairs minister of India did tweet about it. So, so um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, James, then Dulcie again. Okay, so two different subjects. Um, the Security Council this afternoon will uh, discuss the, um, the attacks on Iraq that took place last Wednesday. Um, can you confirm what Iraq is claiming? Um, the, the, um, the Foreign Minister has written a letter to the Security Council saying that it was Turkey was responsible for open and blatant aggression against Iraqi territories. He's calling for an independent international team to investigate. Uh, you have people on the ground. There's a sizable UN mission in Iraq. Can you confirm that in the UN's view, having looked at this closely, that Turkey was responsible? Uh, I uh, would simply refer you back to the statement that we issued uh, a few days ago about this attack. Uh, the Secretary General called for an investigation. We do not have uh, uh, first-hand information about uh, the perpetrators of this attack. And the question I asked you, uh, I think it was last week, um, which is about the, um, the, the very important job that becomes vacant at the end of August, which is the High Commissioner for Human Rights. You said that the SG was committed to consult very widely. Does that involve consulting eminent, well-known human rights groups? Because they are all very keen to give him their views, and apparently no one is reaching out to them. Uh, I've, I've said what I, uh, I've said. He, he, does, uh, he is going to reach out to an, uh, a large uh, number of people uh, as, as he uh, seeks uh, the best uh, replacement and for those Michelle people Bachelet. would include one assumes if he's going to get a representative view on this uh, human rights notable human rights activists from well-known human rights organizations because apparently they are trying to provide input and I'm told that the UN and the, and the executive office of the SG don't seem to be particularly keen to hear their views uh, I've, I've said what I've said on this uh, Dulcie, and then Maggie. Yeah, uh, a follow-up on the JCC. Uh, so the actual physical inspection of these ships is going to be done by the Turkish military? By, by Turkish personnel. Personnel? Yeah. Do you know what branch of the government they'll be working for? Uh, I, I don't speak for, for Turkey. Okay, I, I have some more follow-ups, please. Uh, so, uh, is the uh, International Maritime Organization going to be involved in any of this deal? Well, uh, the International Maritime Organization participated uh, in, in uh, quite a bit of the discussions in terms of of finding uh, ways uh, to ensure the safety of shipping. So, so they are so they are part of this process. Uh, I uh, I hope when I can announce the JCC. Uh, 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 membership, I can uh, I can announce if there's any I, uh, international maritime organization participation in that. Uh, so the actual inspection by the Turks will be done in Turkish waters or international waters, or where where will this inspection be physically taken uh, care of? This is happening in the Black Sea. Yes, um, uh, Maggie. Uh, Farhan, just one follow up on James's question about Haiti. Uh, as I recall, the resolution says that the Secretary General's um, recommendations are due something like October 10th. So in the interim, I mean, with such high civilian casualty rates, is there anything the UN can do or suggest doing uh, before October when that reports due? I, I think we'll, we'll try to stay in touch with the Security Council and, and provide uh, any advice as, as needed ultimately. Uh, our authorities are dependent upon what they what they are willing to authorize. Uh, yes. 
Uh, could you double check where the inspections are taking place? I understood they were taking place at the entrance to the Bosphorus um, near Istanbul. I, yes, that, that sounds accurate, but I, I was just stating it, it'll, it'll be in the Black Sea area, but I, I believe that's, that's correct. Yes. Yes, Evelyn. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, just a quick question on uh, uh, Madame Bachelet's China report. She's leaving in a very short time. Will she be releasing it? Is, does she need anybody's permission besides her own? Uh, uh, that's, that's her decision, and I believe, uh, I believe she had stated her commitment to, uh, to uh, put this report out. Uh, so uh, I believe that's where it stands. And with that, have a great afternoon, everyone.